hit this, the false prophet and the mark of the beast. Now, the image that you see there is an image of a painting done in the 1500s of the false prophet. It's described, he's described in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, as this beast from the earth who comes from the land, from the earth. And he has, it's a strange connotation. He's like, he's got two horns as, as if from a sheep. So we're going to read about it here in a second. Um, so this is the, the full image. I sent this out in our email. Uh, on the right side there is you have the Antichrist on the right, and he's got all the horns and crowns. And he's got all the power over all the nations. And then on the left side, you've got uh, the, the false prophets. So the two beasts come out of the book of Revelation 13. You have this beast from the sea, and there's interpretation. We talked about this last week, but I've been reading more about it where people think because he's from the sea, that that could be symbolic of a person coming from the nations. Uh, of just, you know, strange origins. No one really knows where he'll come from. But we believe, as we looked at last Wednesday, the beast from the sea is the Antichrist. And, and that's Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10. Tonight, we're going to look at the beast from the earth, who is the false prophet, from Revelation 13, 11 through 18. Now, what I like to do as I go through these studies is I like to kind of just read the passage and then deal with with the passage. And so I love that we are going into the scriptures and we're, we're studying more of the scriptures than we are, uh, you know, just looking at ideas that people have. So let's go right, right into the text. I'm just going to read it here. Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up from out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he sounded like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast on his behalf. And compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He also performs great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. He deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that he is permitted to perform on behalf of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the sword wound and yet lived. He was permitted to give a spirit to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so we're going to talk a, a bit more about all this. I want to give you briefly, though, an overview again of the four major views of the end times. And I want to address how the amillennial view and postmillennial view view the false prophet, um, you know, and then we'll look more into the premillennial view that I know many of us hold to or, or were raised in. So if you look on this image here, again, you've got the historic premillennial view at the top. You got the church age on the left there, an indefinite period of time. You're going to have a tribulation of seven years that the church will live through in this view. Jesus will call up the church and rapture the church, and then they come down, and they have the battle of Armageddon, and then the millennium begins for a thousand years, and ends in the new heaven and earth. The second view is the amillennial view. It's we're in the church age. We're also going through the tribulation. And so you see a bit of, of reigning of the church and then also of, of the powers of evil at the same time on the earth. Jesus comes at the end of the church age and at the end of the millennium. It's not a thousand literal year millennium. It's just a indefinite amount of time. And when he returns, everything happens all at once. And then we go into heaven. Um, and, and that's the, really the simplest explanation view of, of all of the views. It's just a simple line that ends with Jesus in heaven. The postmillennial view, again, is the, the most positive view that we're in the church age. The church is ever expanding. The powers of darkness are decreasing to where the golden age is coming and the church will reign on the earth. Jesus will step on a mostly redeemed earth and then heaven will, will come. And that's the, the most positive of the four views. The one that many of us were raised in, that many of us hold to, is the modern premillennial view. We're in the church age. Jesus is going to rapture the church. We're going to be in heaven for seven years while there's tribulation on the earth. We're going to come back down at the end of the tribulation and have the final battle. The millennial kingdom is a literal thousand years, and there's a new heaven and a new earth. The, the millennial words deal with when Jesus appears. And so premillennial means that he appears before the millennium. Postmillennial means that he comes after the millennium, and amillennial means there's no literal thousand years. So when you deal with the false prophet, if we can look at what we call, and I'll explain this, the preterist amillennial or postmillennial view, 
of the false prophet, the amillennial camp and the postmillennial camp share a lot of the same views when it comes to some of these things. The word preterist is a new word. And so I give you a definition here in the first point. Preterists are people who believe that the events of Revelation happened in about the first hundred years, either after the writing of the book of Revelation or from AD 0 to AD 100. There, there are some different views on preterism. Preterists here emphasize the fact that the beast comes from the earth or the land. It's a terminology that in some instances implies the land of Israel. And so even the premillennial view holds to that point that we'll look at here in a minute. The beast could be Gessius Florus. He, he was the Roman ruler of Judea who persecuted Jews and triggered the Jewish-Roman war. And so the preterist approaches a passage like this, and they always look into the first century to see, or the first two centuries to see if that could apply there in some way. And, and they apply they apply this uh, beast false prophet from the earth to Gessius Florus, a lot of them do. The beast this piece also could represent one or more of the false prophets in the years leading up to the fall of the temple in AD 70. And so that's a view of what we call the preterist, a millennial, post-millennial view. Um, we're always, um, we're going to look at the always here view of the amillennial, post-millennial view. The always here view, it's just a title I've given it that others kind of give this view from the amillennials and post-millennials. It's the view that the, the false prophet is always here on the earth. There's always somewhere that through cults, world religions, false prophets that are pushing people into, uh, you know, and away from Christ and into false gods. The false prophet is a symbol of leaders in every age that try to beguile God's people with false teachings and idolatry. Jesus describes such persons within the community of faith as ravenous wolves that wear sheep's clothing. The beast may also take the form of external political, religious, or social pressures to give absolute allegiance to anyone other than Jesus. And so I think, I think there are some truths to that no matter what, right? There, we're always facing the, the false prophets in every age. In America, the false prophet is Joseph Smith, you know, and it's, it's uh, the, the Watchtower Society, you know, and all these different groups that are, that are leading people astray from Jesus. There's one other view. This is kind of the more general amillennial, postmillennial view, and this will be the last slide on these views. And that is that the beast from the earth points to a social, civic, and cultural power that may pressure God's people to submit to the Antichrist. So it's more of a long-form view that the false prophet is just a part of culture that's going to be here until Christ returns. In John's day, this included local governors, religious officials, and false prophets in churches who encouraged Christians to compromise their convictions and to worship the emperor. And so there again, they believe some of this has already been fulfilled. Most of the seven cities mentioned in Revelation 1, 2, and 3 had temples and priests dedicated to Roman emperors. And this is strange, but there are some accounts of priests in the temples who frequently used ventriloquism and lighting to make images seem like they were alive. And so you have a strange verse in verse 15 where it says that the false prophet will be able to make this image of the beast, the Antichrist, seem as if it's alive. And we're going to study that here in a bit. We're going to shift now, though, to the premillennial view of the false prophet. This is the most uh, well-known view that, that, again, many of us were raised in. This is the view of the left behind. But both the uh, premillennial dispensational view that we've discussed in the past and the premillennial historical view really hold to these truths and, and brushstrokes about the false prophet. And the four brushstrokes are as follows. This false prophet will be a religious leader during the future tribulation. Halfway through the tribulation, he will begin calling people to worship the Antichrist. He will place a statue of the Antichrist in the Jewish temple. You see the verses there. And recognizing that the earth or the land sometimes implies Israel in scripture, many dispensationalists expect the second beast, the false prophet, to be a Jewish person. So what I want to do is I want us to go uh, into the text again, and we're going to go verse by verse through Revelation 13. And I'd like to give some longer notes about the false prophet. Before I do, though, let's just agree with what Christ says. The Lord Jesus predicted that in the last days, false Christs and false prophets will appear and will perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. And so while we have seen many prof false prophets throughout the centuries, they all pale in comparison to the coming false prophet mentioned in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18. So we're going to go back into those verses, and now we're going to go very slowly through these and pick apart what we're reading, and I'll flesh out more of what we're reading here. Starting in verse 11, 
Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he sounded like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast, which we again believe is the Antichrist, on his behalf. And he compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. So there's about five things from these two verses I want to point out. Um, let's start here. He says he saw another beast coming out of the earth. Many teachers suggest that his coming up out of the earth indicates he will not come up out of the sea of peoples as the first beast does. That is, he will not be of, of a mixed nationality. Tim LaHaye, who wrote the Left Behind series, in his notes on this verse, he says this. He says that he comes out of the earth may indicate that he will be a Jew. This points to an apostate Jew who during the first three and a half years will lead Israel to make a covenant with the Antichrist and deceive them by hiding his apostasy until the middle of the tribulation period, at which time he will serve his purposes by revealing his apostate beliefs and practices. Now, regardless of your views of, you know, of Tim LaHaye as an author, he does a good job summarizing the premillennial view here of that's been held uh, by most dispensational premillennialists. So let's keep going. You'll see the little image of the false prophet there on the top right of your screen. It says there that he had two horns like a lamb. And so let's flesh that out. The Lord Jesus Christ is often referred to in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation as the Lamb of God. And as such, he has taken away the sin of the world. The false prophet, though coming on the earth, will look like a lamb with two horns. And lambs do not have horns, which are symbols of authority. Instead, they are meek and they're very mild animals. The Lord Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And so the false prophet will come to Israel in sheep's clothing, but God terms him here in Revelation 13 as a beast. And so he'll have this great appearance that just everybody's going to like him and, and think, wow, this is the truth. This is the stuff. It says, number three, he spoke like a dragon. And this suggests he will derive power of speech from the devil. This false prophet then will deceive human beings by acting like a lamb, but really he will speak the words of Satan. So let it be understood that Satan is not against religion at all. He is, however, against personal faith in Jesus Christ. I think Satan would love everyone to be religious and moral as long as they don't believe in Jesus. He would love that. So uh, this next one here, he exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf. The close relationship between these two world leaders is seen in the fact that the false prophet will be given power by the Antichrist himself. His whole purpose will be to work toward the complete dominance of the earth by the Antichrist, including a form of religion satisfactory to the Antichrist. And so there have been a lot of theories as to what type of religion that could be. Some have suggested maybe a fuller form of Islam. Others think it will just be someone that will come along and find a way to unite all the major religions. It, it, it waits to be seen, but there's going to be a lot of signs being displayed to sway a lot of people into believing in this man. And so he makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. This false prophet's basic purpose and operation with all of this power from the Antichrist and speech from the devil will be to drive people all over the earth to worship the Antichrist. When indwelt by Satan in the midst of the tribulation, the Antichrist will be so deceived about himself that he will deem himself as God and he will seek the worship of human beings. And so this form of worship will be propagated by the second beast or false prophet. He may well be described as the high priest of the Antichrist's religious system during the tribulation period. And so you just see that from that, that verse, he's going to try to make everyone on earth worship the Antichrist. And so as we move on to Revelation 13, 13, look at this verse. He also performs great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And so we're going to break that one down. We see that he performs great and miraculous signs. The word translated miraculous signs is the same word used by the Apostle John in his gospel describing the ministry of Jesus. So this leads us to believe that the false prophet will be equipped by Satan and the Antichrist with authority and power to do such supernatural, miraculous signs as to deceive the inhabitants of the earth. This should come as no surprise, though, to any student of the Bible. Just because someone performs miracles doesn't mean they're of God at all. The devil has great power. And I've pointed this out. We know this. Moses, when he threw down his rod before Pharaoh, it turned into a serpent. And the false magicians of Pharaoh, however, were also empowered 
to make their rods turn into serpents, thus duplicating the miracle of the man of God. However, you remember this, right? God caused Moses' serpent to eat up their serpent. So no matter what the devil's able to perform, God is the one that holds all the power. What's fascinating about this verse, though, is he causes even fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And so you remember in the Old Testament, the other story of the, the fire test of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, which proved to the children of Israel that the prophets of Baal were powerless to communicate with God. This probably can be repeated or, or will be tried during the tribulation period. And that may be one of the reasons for the coming of Elijah at the time. We're going to study that as we go through Revelation verse by verse. But Elijah shows up as, as one of the, or someone in the spirit of Elijah, as one of the, the two witnesses. The difference between this confrontation and the previous one, though, is that the false prophet will be able to call down fire from heaven. And so lest this take us by surprise whenever, if we're going to live through the tribulation and we see it on CNN, uh, depending on your view, we should be reminded that Satan, the real force behind the false prophet, brought fire down from heaven and burned up Job's sheep and servants in Job 1 verse 16. You may remember that story if you've studied the book of Job. And so let's keep moving through the main passage here. And we're, we're more than halfway through being done here with the lesson. But Revelation 13, 14 and 15 says, He deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that he is permitted to perform on behalf of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the sword wound and yet lived. He was permitted to give a spirit to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this is very strange. Uh, verse 15 has caused a lot of speculation from people. So let's go over it. The false prophet will cause an image of the Antichrist to be built, and will, it will have power, or he will have power, to give a spirit to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could speak. So we believe in the midst of the tribulation, after the Antichrist has been slain and resurrected, or wounded, you know, and, and brought back what everyone thought he was dying or dead, the false prophet will cause people to build an image just like Nebuchadnezzar's image and will demand that it be worshipped. By some mysterious means, he will give life to that image. And so the speech will be caused by the, the false prophet who in turn will get his authority from the Antichrist and from the dragon. And, and that's Satan himself. That's the dragon. He will issue an order that all who do not worship the beast will be killed. Revelation 20, verse 4 tells us that many will be slain by the, the guillotine. It actually says that uh, John sees people who were beheaded for, uh, you know, they, they came out of the Great Tribulation being beheaded for their faith. This is a scene very similar to what happened to the Israelites as a result of Nebuchadnezzar's image that we begin to realize Satan's tactics, they don't vary significantly. Once again, an order will be given. that those who not bow down and worship him will be killed instead of confronting a fiery furnace. Now they're going to be beheaded in the time of the tribulation. So that's, uh, that's going to end right now, the false prophet. And then we will, we're going to move into the mark of the beast here in just a moment. Uh, but let's pause and let's take a, a little bit of a break here. And uh, any questions about the false prophet? No questions. You guys are hanging in there. Um, hope it was helpful and, and clear going over those points. Um, I just believe we're in a day where even as a Baptist pastor here in Orlando, I see a lot of false Christ and deal with a lot of false Christ here in Orlando. We have uh, so many cults right here on OBT. If you go north of the Turnpike, you'll see there's a, um, I think there's a Mormon church not far from us, but there's, um, there's some cults that'll stand out on the streets uh, north of OBT and just kind of advertise for their, their faith and their, um, I can't remember, uh, like black, uh, Israelites is, is their cult. Uh, and I've, I've met a few of them and talked to them. Uh, we have some in the church here that have tried to witness to them. And it's a very interesting cult that uh, has a big group here in Orlando, but it's, again, it's not the, the true Jesus of scripture. What I'd like to do, if there are no questions or input on the false prophet, Let's go ahead and go into the topic of the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. Uh, this is the one that I think a lot of people right now, you're, you're seeing a lot of guesses and a lot of uh, theories coming out. Uh, so let's go back and let's start, uh, let's start the, the mark of the beast discussion. The mark of the beast. All right. 
what is the mark of the beast? When you read the end of Revelation 13, verse 17, some Bible teachers understand that the mark of the beast to be some sort of physical implant or mark that will be required during the future great tribulation. Without this mark, people will not be able to buy or sell. So this is kind of the major view that we all grew up with. We're all kind of looking at technology. We're all questioning what we're seeing, thinking, could that be the mark? Could that be the mark? Christians have always done that. Now, the amillennial view, the, the postmillennial view, I want to go over theirs real quickly. Uh, other interpreters point out how in the Old Testament, God commanded his people to place the memory of their redemption as a mark on their hand or even bound on their forehead between their eyes in Exodus 13, 16. The original intent of these words seems to have been to allow God's redemption and God's word to mold the hearer's thoughts down between your eyes and his actions, a mark on your hand. In the same way, a mark on the right hand or forehead could imply acting and thinking in accordance with this beast, uh, the Antichrist. Uh, in John's day, this would have meant worshiping the emperor. Cities such as Pergamum and Thyatira had well-established trade guilds that could prevent persons from conducting business if they refused to participate in the emperor cult. It's quite possible that Christians in other cities experienced similar persecution in their buying and selling. Now, I quoted all of that out of Timothy Paul Jones, his book, The Rose Guide to End Times Prophecy. And that's a great book as well. Uh, Patrick, that's the book I was recommending to you as far as having a book that goes over the covenantal and the dispensational views. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit in Timothy Paul Jones' work. It's a, just a very lay level, very simple that goes over all that. And so this has been a way that other interpreters think in scripture, you interpret scripture with other scripture, and they seem to be, see a really strong connection between Exodus 13, 16 and the people of God, and then Revelation 13, uh, 16, and, and what you have there with the connection with the beast. And so that's an interesting thing to think through. What I want to do is show you a few of the theories that have come out over the years. I was shown this when I was in middle school. I had someone that showed me on a common UPC symbol You've got what looks like a six on the left, a six in the middle, and a six on the right. And you'll see there a typical six is pointed out where you got the little two bars there. This is a typical barcode. And you really can't buy anything at all right now in Walmart without scanning a barcode. And so for years, there have been rumors and theories that this is the mark of the beast, and they're just going to end up putting this on, our, on our, right, our left hand and our forehead or one of our hands. And so I think it's the right hand. So... Uh, to, to deal with this, I want to answer that question right now. Is the modern UPC symbol the mark of the beast? Well, listen, uh, George Lohrer, who is the inventor of the modern UPC symbol, he's weighed in on this quite a bit. It's been a theory that, that has been around for you know 40 years or longer. And he has spoken over and over. He just says, listen, the three longer guide bars in each code, one at the front, one in the middle, and one at the end, they do not represent sixes. And so it's a myth, and it's something that's been perpetuated for a long time. And it's not correct information. When you look at this uh, image here, this is not correct to the science and everything that goes into a typical barcode. And so that's from the founder himself. There have been others that have kind of weighed in on it and just said, no, it's not the mark of the beast. These, these are just used as guides when you're scanning. And so uh, the other idea, and this is more popular in our day, is the RFID chip that they're implanting now in some people, and they are, they're looking to some governments and some people are, are talking about implanting every human with one of these. There's more talk about it. Bill Gates has mentioned quite a bit about chipping people. And so this would be something that would be trackable. They'd be able to know where you are. You, you would be able to put all your financial information into the RFID chip. They'd be able to keep up with all your bank stuff. So it remains to be seen that this could be a fulfillment of the passage it does seem that the technology is there, though, for the tracking of selling and buying with something such as an RFID chip. So let's read the verses. Let's go to the scripture. Revelation 13, 16 through 18 says, and he requires everyone, small and great, rich and poor. This is what the, the uh, false prophet is requiring everyone to do, free and slave, to be given a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. The beast's name or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. The, the one who has understanding must calculate the number of the beast because it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Six, six. And so, so much speculation about what does 666 six, six mean. 
I would say for 2,000 years, Christians have been a bit mystified about it. They've, they've had a bunch of theories. I want to go back to Tim LaHaye again. He says in Revelation Unveiled, he says, we only know that six is the number of a human being. It is one short of the perfect number seven, and humankind was created on the sixth day. Therefore, in Bible numerology, it is used to refer to humankind. And that's a common belief held by many, but I think it was John MacArthur today when I was reading his notes on it. He just said no one really knows. And so to speculate too much on 666 right now is, is just a bit dubious and, and not you know, worth uh, too much study in a way. He just doesn't feel like we can fully know until maybe later on. And so the false prophet will use these marks as a mean or, or use the mark of the beast here as a means of forcing people to worship the Antichrist. He will demand that everyone have his mark on their foreheads or on their hands in order to buy or sell. This economic pressure will be instrumental in causing many weak, worldly individuals to succumb to the establishment of this monarch, this, this great ruler, the Antichrist, which will be tantamount to the personal rejection of Christ and acceptance of Antichrist. One can scarcely imagine the pressures of having to possess such a mark in order to secure the necessary food for his family. And so, physically speaking, it will not be, or it will be necessary for every human being to have the mark of the beast. Spiritually speaking, though, it will be fatal. We've already, uh, in the Bible, if you study the, the book of Revelation, you will repeatedly see that those who are redeemed by the Lamb, those who have the seal of God, do not have the mark of the beast. But those who receive the Antichrist mark will have made the final decisions for eternity to reject Christ and to worship the Antichrist, his arch enemy. And so let's look at his final judgment. What's going to happen to the false prophet? How does it end for him? It's very simply laid out in Revelation 19:20. But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with him, the false prophet, who had performed the signs in his presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image with these signs. Both of them, the Antichrist and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And so we see his final judgment in Revelation 19 and verse 20. All right, that is the, the full lesson tonight on the mark of the beast and on the false prophet. So just to open it up, I mean, I think all of us have had some interesting theories over the years about the mark of the beast. I've heard some pretty funny ones. Uh, some have thought maybe we're, we're in that day where uh, they feel like uh, maybe the mask is the mark of the beast somehow. Because you can't go into a store and buy or sell right now in Orange County without the mask. I don't think that's it, guys. But, uh, you know, I think we're grasping for almost anything. Anyone else out there, though, maybe you've heard yourself some strange theories on the Mark of the Beast over the years. And maybe you want to share that. Uh, anyone have any fun uh, ideas as to what you may have thought that was years ago or, or even maybe a recent theory you've heard about? That's okay if there's none. Uh, what about any questions about the mark of the beast or false prophet? Uh, and, and if none, any questions about anything general about end times prophecy? Let's just open the, the airwaves. <laughs> One question, I'll, I'll bite. Uh, one question, yeah, go I for have. It. it's kind of an open, an open question, and um, I really don't have the answer to it. But uh, what is the answer to the person who believes that um, this, uh, from <clears throat> uh, chapter thirteen through fourteen, are talking more about spiritual events than worldly events? Has any theories like that come to your attention or um, any answer to that, Pastor? I mean, Patrick, are you referring to like the, the um, a millennial person will view 13 and 14 as that. They'll see it as kind okay. of large brushstrokes of culture and society. And they'll take the verses that you have in Thessalonians and they combine them. They say there's a spirit of Antichrist. People are part of this spirit of Antichrist. They uh, depends on the view. A lot of your amillennialists are open to a, a, an actual final antichrist coming. You know, it's the postmillennialists that's not. They they don't believe any person is going to show up who will be that evil 
Nikolai Carpathia that we've read about in the Left Behind books. They don't believe in, in a physical, you know, manifestation of the Antichrist. But your amillennialists, uh, some of them do. They, they believe we're going through tribulation, and they believe we're going to go through that, and, and someone's going to come that will fulfill that. But they also, because amillennialists take everything pretty figuratively, they will apply it figuratively to the cultures, to the spirit of the age. Can we all agree? I mean, we're in a day and age where a lot of what we're getting on television has about it the spirit of Antichrist. It's uh, very anti-Christian. It's, you know, we've been, we've been seeing uh, Jesus mocked in our culture for years without any repercussions. You know, but if there's anything else mocked, like Muhammad or you name it, I mean, there is ultimate, you know, repercussions, instant terminations and firings. But there, there is a free range in media, in, in you know, movies. My, my family and I watched the movie uh, on Apple TV. I think it was Apple Plus. Uh, there's a movie that came out called Greyhound that involved Tom Hanks as an actor of a World War II destroyer ship. I don't know if any of you have been able to see Greyhound. We watched the film, and we were shocked how pleasantly it's portrayed a Christian. Tom Hanks himself plays a, a character that prays, that's reading the Bible, and that pauses throughout the film to pray and ask God for direction. And we were all blown away. It's like this is the nicest depiction of a Christian we've seen in the media in years, played by a pretty big-name actor like Tom Hanks, you know. So it just surprised us a bit, um, pleasantly surprised us. You know, you just don't get much of that. But, uh, but usually Christians are portrayed in media as, as, you know, really awful people, you know. Uh, there, there are moments where they're just not portrayed well. So I don't know, Patrick, I, I think your amillennial and your postmillennial see it as the big brushstrokes in culture, where your premillennial uh, zooms in and they see, uh, you know, an actual person. It's, it's going to be a person that's the Antichrist and a person that's the false prophet. Good question. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind whenever I, I read like verse 11, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, I try to think, think of myself, can, is there an interpretation where some of this could have happened in history, or yeah. you have a positive anchor where, hey, this really could have satisfied, you know, this event. So the thing that, that, that comes to mind when I read verse 11, and I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, you know, I think of Baphomet of the occult. And that's a striking image, and that is an image that's currently being used by the Freemasons today. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's any, if you had any comment on that either. No, um, but I will say Southern Baptists have historically viewed uh, Freemasonry as a cult. And uh, I know a lot of churches and a lot of us have maybe grown up a grandfather that was in Freemasonry. It's a secret society that uh, every cult book I've got on my shelf uh, has a big old chapter on Freemasons. And so if you're in Freemasonry, and I know it's a secret society, and you want to talk about it, um, I've had a lot of discussions over the years with Freemasons, and I would love to share with you the information I have as a Baptist pastor on that. My last church had it written to their constitution that no one who was involved in Freemasonry could be involved in the leadership of the church or membership. They would not accept any, any members into that fellowship that were involved in Freemasonry. And then another church that uh, Jenny and I went to visit with before we came to South Orlando Baptist, all of their leadership was involved in Freemasonry. And that was the reason why we declined. It's like, we don't want to serve in a church that is, uh, you know, and they weren't, you know, lower level. They were like 32, 33 level Freemasons, if you know anything about Freemasonry. I, I don't know, though, Patrick. I don't know if, if Baphomet would be a possible. Uh, I mean, I think the image is there. I mean, you got a goat with, you know, the two horns, and, and uh, you know, that, that seems to kind of fit. Um, I don't know. You know, it, I, I think what you were saying earlier, though, ties into what we call the preterist view, where a lot of folks will read something like chapter 13 of Revelation, and they try to see where it could have been fulfilled in the first hundred years. Of, of the church or of, uh, you know, in the first century. And uh, I've got friends that hold to the, the preterist views. I really struggle with the preterist views. I always feel like they're really trying to squeeze certain things from these chapters really hard into some people that I don't think fulfill as loudly as I, I mean, I, again, I kind of lean towards, we're going to see an antichrist someday. We're going to see, you know, these people showing up on the scene someday. So that's a good question. Um, yeah, I always wonder yeah. about events of history, like, you know, the abomination on the temple, you know, you go to Jerusalem today, there's a mosque on the temple now, um, 
you know, uh, the many false prophets that you mentioned, and uh, I always just wonder if there if there are you know, you know good. I've never seen a good, solid, cohesive story of the of the of the uh, um, I guess we call the all millennial um, view yeah. Um, yeah. that really really ties it down. This event, this event, this event, where you can say, hey, you know, this was satisfied because right. you know one of the one of the properties of, of prophecy is that it's supposed to be very clear after it happened, right? Yeah, that's true. That's very true. I believe that. Like, like I was, I think in my opening prayer tonight, talking about Ezekiel 25, I think it was 25, where God is about to judge Tyre, and he gives all of these prophecies about Tyre being destroyed. You know, all of your houses are going to be thrown into the ocean, and, and you're like, what in the world? That is very specific. And it was fulfilled when Alexander the Great showed up in 322 and took their houses, threw them into the ocean, and built a, a ramp out to this island where everyone was at and, and you know destroyed them all and it was pretty cool it was fulfilled a bit with nebuchadnezzar a bit with alexander and then a bit later on but everything came to pass exactly as prophesied in in uh, the book of ezekiel so i agree with you i think when they're fulfilled i i man they're easy to see where they're fulfilled i think you have like the city of jericho um you know there was a curse on jericho where no one would ever rebuild that city uh, Babylon's the same way. No one's ever been able to rebuild Babylon. And we all live in the day where, who was it? It was, um, uh, no, um, who was the leader that we went in? Saddam Hussein, right? He tried to rebuild Babylon. And then the American war with him uh, happened and halted him from being able to rebuild Babylon, which was actually a, a fulfillment of prophecy of scripture that says Babylon will never be rebuilt. So if he would just read the Bible, you know, he, he would have known this is a bad investment. I don't need to invest in rebuilding this old city. Um, so I agree with all, with all you're saying. Um, I think uh, another idea that I heard, uh, my grandfather thought credit was going to be the mark of the beast. Uh, credit cards. He ran a tire shop uh, in Alabama. And, uh, and, and so he always kind of didn't like credit. When everything was shifting away from cash over to credit, he had a lot of fear from people thinking that's going to be the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell without a credit card. And uh, in America, it seems like people can't buy or, you know, anything without using a credit card. It's a problem we are having, but a different problem than the mark of the beast. So very good, very good questions. Anything else, uh, general question? I have a question. Do people think that the mark of the beast, like will show up over time and then it actually like is going to be used in the tribulation in the future. Like it will like become either the credit card or the RFID chip. And then over time, it'll become the mark of the beast. I think that's a great question because I, I think Christians are very uh, cautious and nervous about any new technology, right? Because, um, you know, it sounds like if you if you follow the dispensational view on these things, they believe the mark of the beast is going to show up right at the midpoint of the tribulation. That it'll be, you're going to have the one world system, the one world government, the one world economy, and they're going to come, you know, and use this one world uh, approach for everyone to be able to buy and sell and track what's being done. And so I think for the believer and the reader, Zach, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say, if you've got Christ in you, you're going to, you're going to know. Like, like Patrick was saying, man, when, when prophecy comes to pass, the believer that's read up on it knows. You've studied the signs of the time. Because I know this, there are a lot of Christians a bit anxious about a vaccine for the coronavirus. Because you've had some discussion uh, from Bill Gates and others saying, we need to tag everyone somehow that gets the coronavirus. We need to do like a miniature tattoo or do an actual tag, like an RFID chip, uh, those that get the coronavirus. And, and to eliminate the coronavirus, we need to make it where they can't go into Walmart. If they haven't had the vaccine, they can't buy or sell where everyone's going to be stuck at home buying everything on, on maybe Walmart where you, they just put it in your car or on Amazon. You know, it's not fully thought through. But already believers are looking at it going, this could be the mark of the beast. You know, I don't want to get a vaccine if it means it, it's going to be the mark of the beast, you know. Um, so I think that's a very important question, but I like to lean on that. I think we're going to know, we're going to know it when it shows up on TV and Bill Gates is standing there, you know, saying, here's what's coming. 
we're all going to go ding, ding, ding. That's it. That's the thing. I'm not getting that. You know, I'm going underground. I'm going to buy my Jim Baker tribulation buckets and uh, and go go uh, you know eat my my uh, mac and cheese for ten years. I'm joking around. <laughs> If you've not seen the Jim Baker Tribulation Buckets, look for it on YouTube. It'll bless you. Somebody did a really silly edit of it that one of you sent me last week, and my kids and I laughed so hard watching that. So I'll see if I can send that on. But if, if you believe we're going through the tribulation, please don't tune in to Jim Baker. Don't do that. You know? <laughs> so, he's not a teacher I would recommend at all, ever. Um, Christianity has had so many black eyes over the last few years. He's won. Uh, God have mercy on all of us with what's happening with Liberty University. Uh, you know, so many in our culture view Jerry Falwell as a representative of Christianity. And we're all looking at it as Christians going, oh, no, he, he's never really represented all of us. You know, he's not even a preacher, you know. So uh, he's got his issues. Um, so sorry to bring all that up. But, uh, but very good question, Zach. Very, very good question. Hi, I have a question. Yeah, um, kind can. of. Yeah, I'm actually Don Umberger's niece. She sent this to me because oh. I've been asking her about end times. So we've been chatting Yay. about that. Yeah, Welcome. Um, it was a great uh, teaching on it. So I guess the question kind of would be, you know, I've been doing my own studies on it. And I think, too, as believers, don't you also feel some of it's a heart condition? Because if you had the chip, let's just say like he brought up a good question, if you get it and then it turns out to be the bark, mark of the beast. In all reality, we weren't denouncing our faith by getting it at Amen. the time, right? So it's not really like That's you true. took it and you sold out your faith on it. You you kind of got it Amen. and then that was it at the time. And if it later turns, so sometimes I think the chip may be a precursor for it, but not the actual, just because of that, like if they gave it to me, but it didn't have anything to do with my faith and I'm not worshiping right. the person, then I, I feel like it. I'm just hesitant on if it is only because it's not tied to my faith at this time. Amen. Uh, no, we, we absolutely affirm that, that if you have received Christ as your Savior and Lord, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Say that the mark is forced upon you. Uh, I remember reading the Left Behind books, and they actually had that as a storyline, where someone who was a child in the Left Behind books had the mark forced on them. And the books were very clear to defend that his heart, you know, had trusted on Christ. His decision was Christ. And and they used him as like a double agent in the storyline. They were able, he was able to get in and access things and get close to things that they couldn't have gotten to without him, you know, in the storyline. It served a pretty interesting role in the story. Um, but I would agree there. I think um, it always comes down to the heart. I, I think another question would be, would someone who gets the mark, would there still be any chance they could repent and be saved? I still would like to say yes, even though the, the terminology in Revelation seems final. I, I know that God is always, when someone repents, he relents. Even Nineveh, you know, when they repented, he relented. He, he didn't pour out his wrath. And so all, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, I would just say, Shannon, I think anybody that, that trusts Christ, it, the, the promises will always hold true that all who come unto him, he will in no wise cast out. Uh, but I do think uh, wholesale, those that dive in, take the mark, they're basically saying when they take it, I'm buying into this religion. I'm putting my whole life into this, you know, and I am wholesale into this. Uh, I still think God could save even in that uh, someone, someone like that. Maybe, maybe they apply what Jesus says. And I'm taking a verse way out of context on this one, but where he says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. You know, <laughs> maybe they're like, I don't want this mark. I want to follow Jesus. So I'm cutting this hand off and follow the Lord. I don't know if I would recommend that to a new brother, uh, but, uh, but I think that is an excellent question you raised. Good studies, by the way. You're doing a good job in your studies. Any other open questions? I think all these are great. How about virtual marks like with Facebook? Like, you know, you hit like and your, your facial recognition, it pops up, you know, a mark. Hey, you're a believer in the, the beast or you're a believer for Christ. It automatically correlates you. Have you ever heard yeah. one of those before? I have. Uh, yeah, because whenever anyone uploads a photo with me in it, uh, I'm always nervous when it says, you've been tagged in a photo, you know, uh, that's never, and it's something from high school or college where I'm like, oh man, untag, untag, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be associated anymore with uh, some of the activities or whatever I was involved in in high school, it seems like, but um, so yeah, I mean, the facial recognition, Patrick, is there, uh, every, anytime you head down to the theme parks, 
Uh, they've got them in all of our theme parks, but I don't want to say, you know, don't go to the theme parks. By all means, if you're able and healthy, go. They could use our support. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's going to be very difficult to uh, – to, to kind of get around the system. I think believers are going to have, have to be very wise and savvy and, you know, gentle as doves, but wise as serpents on how to make a living and how to eat food when all this is going on during the tribulation. And there's, there's going to be a black market, a Christian black market that'll help it go somehow. You know, I think people will be off the grid and growing beans and doing what they can, but um, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, you've got helicopters, you know, that can find you using uh, all their technology now. We don't have our helicopter pilot with us tonight, but if he was here, I mean, they, they use infrared and everything. Where even in the caves, you got to go deep down to the caves for them to know you're not you're not in there. We're in a bad state, by the way, for caves. If we got to build a tribulation cave, it ain't going to happen here in Florida. We're just going to have to find a different system. We're going to have to put on gator outfits and just swim around in the lake all day. I don't know. I mean, it, it, we're in trouble here. So we're, we all need to buy some land in Kentucky, I think. Or Minnesota. <laughs> or Minnesota. Oh, not Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. God bless Minnesota right now. Pray for Minnesota, folks. There's a lot going on there. Um, there any, other, any other questions before we sign off here in a few minutes? Good. I mean... I, am I the only one that grew up with some of these stories about the Mark of the Beast? Did any of you else hear about the UPC symbols? There you go. A few hands. Credit cards. Yeah, okay. I'm not alone on that. Yeah. We've all heard about the, the Bill Gates chip. You know, everyone's been a little scary yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, Every time you hear about new technology, you're constantly hearing, even when there's new political things going on, you constantly hear about this. So it's something that's talked about every time there's something new going on. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think an idea of, of having a vaccine is an easy way to get people, you know, to, mm -hmm. to go along with whatever. Um, if, if it's going to be a worse disease and the antichrist has found the cure and, and you just got to, you know, get that cure, that'd be an easy way for a lot of people to say, all right, he's our savior. He's, he's saving us. I think what's fascinating too, that, that my sons and I are always watching documentaries on North Korea and praying for North Korea. But when you study North Korea and you see the, the worship people have for their grand leader, it's tragic because North Korea used to be the Jerusalem of, the, of Asia. They used to have more Christians in that area of Asia than you know, any other city. And since the war, the Korean War, and, and since things have changed, there is this amazing worship that goes on nationally and it's, it's forced in a way it's forced in a big way. There's great fear, but the worship these people give to their grand leader, you know, it's, I think to me, it gives me a glimpse of what people are going to be seeing when the antichrist figure shows up, you know, that he's going to be mesmerizing. He's going to have all the answers and he's going to be so smooth and you're going to vote for him. You know, everyone's going to want to vote for the guy. He's funny. He's going to be you know good looking fella probably. And, and just, I, uh, the, the theory that so many of your, your backwoods uh, folks are working on right now is we're going to go through such an economic fallout from COVID that they believe what we're going through right now sh could be setting the stage and a precursor for a grand leader to show up that's going to have the solution and answer for all the economic issues of the world. Uh, there's really no nation doing really well with COVID. I mean, it seems like China seems to be getting some advantage. Their economy's you know, coming back. But it's affected all of us globally, and it's really hurt all of the, the economy of the world. We, we're going to be spending a lot of years picking up uh, the pieces from this year, sadly. So, you know, we'll see. Time remains to be seen. And if we're raptured out, we're raptured out. You know, we won't we don't even be around. If, if, uh, I'm, and I'm hopeful for that. I would love to just be out of here. I'd love to go.